Hi, this is Jack Lifton, and this is the Critical Metals Corner for Wednesday, February 24th, 2021. And today I decided we're going to celebrate an anniversary. Today I'm calling the 6,000th anniversary of the beginning of the use of copper as a technology metal. It was for perhaps its first thousand years of, of being used as, as for tool making, the most important uh, and critical metal uh, on earth. Uh, it went into a hiatus for a while and in the uh, 19th century has come back and is today clearly the most important critical metal of all. Because the transmission of electricity, which is the power source of, of our civilization, depends entirely on copper wire. So I, I decided today we're going to have a, an episode of what, Critical Metals University. Because I'm reading a, a whole lot of uninformed uh, commentary on critical metals and on uh, the technology metals, uh, a term I first started using about 15 years ago. So let's take a, a look at, at uh, human history. Now stay awake. Uh, the Stone Age, uh, we're told, ended about 6,000 years ago. Interesting uh, coincidence there. And, but the fact is it really didn't. The Stone Age where stone was used for tools and and structures and, and and shelter didn't end until around 1880. And it ended when a French engineer, Ferdinand Eiffel, built a very tall tower out of out of steel. Not iron really, but but it was a form of steel. And he showed that you could bear enormous weights Steel could bear enormous weight, so much that the original uh, Eiffel Tower weighed something on the order of 7,000 tons. And, and I don't, I've seen it a hundred times, but I don't recall how tall it is. Let's say it's 15 or 20 stories at least. That was the first structure built by human beings where the load was borne entirely by a metal, in this case, iron and steel. So until then, Stone was was and 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 plant fiber, i.e., wood, were the principal methods of constructing buildings for human beings for from time immemorial until about 200 years ago. So that was the I call that the Stone Age. I, I don't care what anthropologists and paleontologists say. That was the Stone Age. What happened? We entered what I call the second phase of the Iron Age. The first phase of the Iron Age was where uh, rather brittle iron and, and, and uh, tiny amounts of handmade steel were used for tools, tools, nothing else. And this, this age, uh, the Iron Age, actually uh, came to an end in 1867, in, uh, very near to where I am today, in Wyandotte, Michigan, when Sir Henry Bessemer uh, invention the Bessemer converter be, began operations and started producing, mass producing steel. So the age of steel began in 1867. We are still in the age of steel. Uh, today, of the 2 billion plus tons of metal produced in this world every year, 95% is steel. Um, there, and there's a, the next metal produced in quantity is aluminum, which was not known in mass, in mass use until the late 19th century. And third is our good old friend copper at 30 million tons a year. Copper has been produced continuously for human use for about 6,000 years. It, it is absolutely the winner of the contest. But I think that people misunderstand the term technology. Technology is very simply the engineering of science. But there really wasn't much science until the, the modern age. Let's say that I have no problem calling uh, Galileo 
a scientist. He was, he was probably the first modern scientist, and he, he died about 400 years ago. So science is, is relatively new. Bef before then, we had, let's call it the artisan period of, of human uh, invention. People uh, had discovered copper and gold uh, in, in metal form. As, as far back as maybe 10,000 years ago, and it was used for decoration. And then about 6,000 years ago, somebody figured out that uh, the, the copper piece they dropped in the fire had gotten very hard, and one of its edges was very sharp. So the hardening of copper uh, was uh, discovered, and soon we had copper tools. We had copper tools. Uh, I don't know how you, how most of you think the pyramids were built, but a lot of copper tools were worn out. We we see in the quarries where the stones were quarried that the uh, there's a lot of copper shavings, and that's because they were using hardened copper chisels. And remember, the Great Pyramid was built almost 5,000 years ago, so uh, copper chisels had been used for some time then. the The point is that that was not technology. That was simply discovery. Uh, but I'm sure it was trial and error. We have no idea how many thousands of years it may have taken for it generally to be known that a, a copper could be fire hardened and, and, keep, and form an edge you could keep. Okay. Now, again, I keep hearing from my younger friends that, oh, these new inventions, uh, television, uh, c uh, computers, uh, rocket ships, um, radio, uh, that type of thing. Boy, this is this is the modern age. Well, I've got news for all of you. Every one of the things I just mentioned was developed more at at least 100, maybe as much as 200 years ago. Now, why didn't why didn't, for example, television, which was first broadcast in the late 1920s? Uh, become universal. How, why Why wasn't Franklin Roosevelt's uh, second inaugural address broadcast on big screen TV to, to everybody? Well, the reason is because the limited, the metals known and in wide availability in, in that period, let's say from 1900 on to 1940, were uh, incapable of making small devices, okay? I, what I'm trying to say is that the, the modern age of technology, in other words, the modern versions of these old technology, by the way, computers were developed in the 19th century. And, and, and uh, the electronic computer of today uses the exact same logic that uh, that uh, Lord Byron's daughter used when she when she devised the first computer program about 200 years ago. So the 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 intelligence behind the computer has it is is fundamental. The the actual machine itself that's that's been changing rapidly. Now why? What has the modern computer, television set, radio? If any of any of you remember that. Um, and let's say displays of all kinds, what, what do they have in common? They have in common that they're miniaturized. We, we could have made, uh, the cars could have been built with uh, power windows in 1910, except the electric motor for, for, or, for, or, for the electric window would have, in those days, probably weighed as much as the car. So that wasn't done. And Keep in mind that miniaturization is the driving force for technological advancement. Um, the, the computer that flew on the Apollo that landed on the moon, I believe, was about 64 kilobytes of memory or 32, something like that. In other words, much less than your smartwatch. Much, much less. Okay. Today's rockets uh, in the space station, for example, pro uh, the space station and, and the, the vessels used to reach it, the computers in them probably have a million or a billion times as much memory and are at least 
10 or 100 million times faster than the ones that took us to the moon. But we got to the moon with that, with that old hammer and tongs technology. What didn't we get? We didn't get, we didn't get flying cars, did we? Remember, remember the Jetsons were, were all going to fly? No, that didn't happen. We did get handheld television. That lasted, I, I think I blinked and handheld little television sets, and of course I had some, were gone, and suddenly we had smartphones. And you, if you want, you can watch uh, you know, Tom and Jerry cartoons on smartphones or, or their equivalent, uh, the U.S. Congress debating. You can watch that if you like. And um, we have, let's say, if you've ever seen the inside of a computer, most of it is structure. The actual working parts are tiny, thin chips of silicon, germanium, gallium, arsenide, and each one of them, those chips, has perhaps a hundred layers deposited one after another to form the uh, cert the logic circuits that we we refer to as as a computer. So it's their miniature. The door, the door on your car has several electric motors to raise, or at least one set to raise the window. That's a miniature motor. The, your power steering runs on a miniature motor. And what, how did we do that? How do we miniaturize electronics, miniaturize uh, motors? How, how do we do that? Well, the answer is we went through World War II. And in World War II, uh, Scientists were told, and engineers were told, to look for solutions to problems. For example, how do we mount a radar set on an airplane? We want it to be on the plane. And, and the engineers thought, my God, uh, these things weigh tons. Okay, How are we going to do that? Well, one of the biggest problems was switching electricity, switching it on and off. And mechanical relays are not only uh, large and noisy, um, if you want to switch a lot of power, they're, they're, they're quite uh, weighty. So that, that didn't solve the problem. Well, somebody, I can't remember who it was, but I think I knew once, uh, just said, you know what? Uh, silicon, if it's extremely highly purified, and then just a little tiny bit of this uh, of arsenic is, is added, it will actually conduct, it'll conduct It'll take alternating current and and turn into direct current, and 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 you can also take extremely high, and the other way around too, and you can create extremely high frequency switching. Well, radar is extremely high frequency signals, and so thus was born the uh, air airplane mountable uh, radar set, and one thing led to another. And in the, I actually met uh, the gentleman who invented the transistor. And uh, what happened was, after World War II, so many exotic metals, minor metals that had never been produced in, in invisible quantities before, were produced for 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 R and D science. No cost was concerned. Nobody worried about cost. So. Before World War II, I suspect the entire world supply of gallium would have fit in your back pocket. After World War II, there were tons and tons of it. Why? Because it was used to stabilize a, uh, a, an alloy of plutonium. And that stable phase of plutonium was the one that goes boom when enough of it is in one place. So when... when when the uh, Manhattan Project went to Alcoa and said, we need gallium. And Alcoa said, so what? We, we can't afford, the gallium only presents at five, 10 parts per million in aluminum. We just let it run through to the aluminum because taking it out would be horribly expensive. And the Defense Department, excuse me, the War Department in 1943 said, um, how much would it cost you to produce, we, we need tons. They said $10 million, which for information today would be a quarter of a billion dollars. So the Defense Department said, uh, the guy pulled out his checkbook. He said, Here, here's the check. Uh, when, when can you have it? And they said, it'll take a couple of years. He said, we'll give you six months. And they did. They did. So at the end of the war, gallium all over the place. 
no problem getting gallium. You, you could you could use it, uh, you know, for any, for many things. But there were no uses. Well, comes uh, the transistor was was first one was made from germanium, a, another material that was only available because of the enormous amount of processing of other metals, a tiny bit of which were germanium. And so that it was extracted and germanium metal was made as a curiosity. Well, um, the uh, Shockley and Bardeen decided in 1946 or seven at Bell Telephone Laboratories, they thought we can make a switch, we can make a high frequency electronic switch. And they used uh, a, a chip, a chunk of germanium and, and, a, and a contact, and that became the transistor. Uh, then, and this shows you how interesting my life has been, I, I met the gentleman who, who had looked at that and he said, you know what, you don't need the bulk germanium for that. If we just put down a thin film of germanium, we can sort of print the necessary circuit Onto the onto the germanium, and taking that and silicon, and he invented the integrated circuit. A guy named Kilby at Texas Instruments, in in the I think it was in the 60s. Okay, so now we have silicon. The second I think it's the second most common uh, element on the earth is suddenly a technology metal, and germanium uh, used sort of went away because silicon was a lot cheaper and much better. And in the meantime, somebody in the in the 50s said, you know what, I'm going to try gallium arsenide, see what the electronic properties are. Well, boom, that was the highest frequency switching material ever seen. And what did we get from that? Optoelectronics. We can now send images at, at, at a speed such that when when we're looking at our at our television screen, we don't we don't see the flickering. Okay, the information and and the and the uh, putting the imaging of it is coming that fast. Um, in the war, rare earths were used for ammunition, pyro, uh, pyrophoric ammunition. Every tenth round in a machine gun belt was a copper slug covering a mixed rare earth metal core. And the, when, the, when the outer copper film burned away, the, the rare earth metal caught fire. And so you, John Wayne could hold that machine gun and you'd see these white dots. They're actually every 10th round while his ribs are breaking and his spine is crushing, you know. But he, he, he could hold a 30 caliber machine gun. I, I've never seen anybody else could do that. The point is that was rare earths. So that was nice. Um, in the war, they needed uranium, and uranium had been used for um, making ceramic, yellow ceramic glazes prior to the war. There weren't any uses for uranium, but some discoveries in, in Germany and England uh, in the late 30s pointed out that you could make a hell of a weapon if you could just get enough of the correct form of uranium. So everybody started looking for uranium. And America was getting uh, our uranium, I believe, from the Belgian Congo uh, during the war. And after the war, the uh, search for uranium, when I was a little boy, everybody had a, a Geiger column. You went, out in the, in, you went out in the countryside, and if you found a lot of clicks, you called because the government was offering $25,000 for, and that was a lot of money in 1950, for the discovery of uranium deposits. Well, they sort of found one at Mountain Pass, California, except it was just a uranium, small amount of, of, of uranium and thorium in a big deposit of rare earths. Well, so what? The military had enough rare earths for, for ammunition, but they started looking at rare earths for their electronic properties. In, in the 60s, Color television. I, I remember the first color television. They looked like a washed, a, a, a too often washed uh, shirt. It, it was so dull the colors. Then somebody discovered that you could make a brilliant red phosphor with the rare earth element europium, but it had to be pure. So 
some technology that the French had discovered in the 20s was now used to ultra purify, separate and purify rare earths. And the target for a company called Molycorp in, in the 1960s was producing uh, europium from their rare earth ore, of which it was one tenth percent of the total rare earths in their ore. And they built a huge system uh, to do that. Unfortunately for them, by the time the system was done, um, scientists at the uh, N NBC had decided that they only needed about one fifteenth as much europium, so the price dropped. And 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 although the Molycorp kept making rare earths, um, there really wasn't much call for it. Okay. Last thing I'm going to bore you with: in the 1970s, designers of cars at General Motors said, we've got to have power windows. The engineer said, uh-uh, those magnet, those, those, those motors are too big, too thick, and the, and the door is going to be so thick it'll look like, it'll look like a bank vault door. We don't want to do that. And, and at that time, two scientists, one in Japan and one at General Motors, had been looking at some Russian work from the 60s on permanent magnets made with uh, the rare earth samarium and the rather rare metal cobalt. And they said, you know what? This, this kind of magnet is 100 times as strong as an iron magnet, which means it can be 100th the size and have the same strength. And thus, the rare permanent magnet motor was uh, built. Um, the, the engineering of that uh, into mass production was done by the Sumitomo Corporation in conjunction with General Motors because each one of them had one of the premier scientists in this area. And the, the making of rare permanent magnet motors uh, became uh, went into mass production in the early 1980s, thus giving Molycorp a reason to keep <laughs> producing rare earths at, at, in Mountain Pass and starting a new industry. Well, pretty soon some some financier cornered the cobalt market and the price of these magnets skyrocketed. So Professor Sagawa in Japan said, you know what? How about neodymium iron boron? That that's that's just as good. And see so they said, okay, well we got to get the neodymium. Well Molycorp was there. They, they were producing uh, the neodymium, and the rest is history. Now, we have these metals uh, to, were unknown in, in, let's say, before World War II. World War II is the breaking point. So everything I've said leads me to this. What are critical metals? Critical metals are those uh, for which without which we can't make something that we want to have, okay? So the, there's two impediments to critical metals in any, in any society. One is how much does it cost to produce them? The other one is do we have any of that in our country? Well, both of them are, are active in, in our world. Uh, there's I, I'm, I've, I keep saying copper is the, the most critical metal in our, in our civilization because you can produce electricity in any number of ways. You can consume electricity in any number of ways, but you can only transmit it with copper. Okay, so that's number one. Well, the U.S. has a lot of copper. Alaska is loaded with copper. Arizona has a lot of copper. Utah has a lot of copper. Not a problem. Iron. Um, we have we have lots of, of iron ore in the United States, but uh, today we produce about 70 million tons a year of steel in the United States, which is more than enough for, for our, our needs. That's, that's not that's not critical. What's critical are are mostly these very. I won't say they're all rare. They're rare, but they're they're the reason that. Many metals are rare is not just that you don't find much of them on the planet, because neodymium, for example, is more common than lead in the Earth's crust. The problem is we need deposits of them large enough to be economical from which to produce uh, the metals we need.
That's the real problem. And nature did not provide a uniform distribution of these materials, not at all. Uh, the majority of the accessible rare earths are in China. The majority of the accessible cobalts in the Congo. Uh, the majority of copper is along the Pacific coast of South America. The, the, we don't have a world government. We don't have a world nation. And geopolitics is a, is a big problem uh, for the supply of metals. So just to to wrap up this session of Critical Metals University, I, I want to say that before you decide which metals are critical, you need to decide what it is you can do without. I, I, notwithstanding, it's the end of the world if we don't reduce uh, carbon emissions. I want to tell you something. We can do without electric cars, and if you if you insist on electric cars, I, 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 this is going to make me a lot of uh, unfriends. You don't need cobalt. You don't even need nickel. Most of China's batteries are lithium iron phosphate. China produces none of not any. They they don't produce. They do produce iron. Uh, they produce very little lithium. They don't have much phosphate material. Um, nobody's worried about it. These are cheap and universally available. Critical metals to be critical must be for something we either need or want to have. So next week, I'm going to tell you what we need and, and you'll see the difference between what we need and what we want to have. Uh, until then, talk to you.